It was 2017. My best friend and I, we actually had tickets for the Hall of Fame weekend where Pete Rose was supposed to be inducted into the Phillies Wall of Fame. The plaque was ready. The bobbleheads were all made up. I'm not even a big bobblehead fan, but I was looking forward to getting this. The Phillies had had a fan vote before the season on who should be on the Wall of Fame. And at the time, Pete Rose was the most glaring omission. But Pete Rose isn't being kept off the Phillies Wall of Fame because of the gambling issue. Pete Rose is being kept off the Phillies Wall of Fame because he admitted, under oath, that he was having a sexual affair with a teenager while he was a 30-year-old married man. I mean, when you come down to it, Pete Rose is his own worst enemy. He may be the hit king. He may be one of the greatest baseball players to ever play the game. But in the end, he's still a jerk. And he only has himself to blame for that. I used to be a militant supporter of Pete Rose getting into the Hall of Fame. But I'm not anymore. As much as I recognize all of his achievements, as much as I recognize all that he's done for the game, when you come down to it, he's a selfish jerk. And he doesn't deserve to have this accolade, at least while he's still alive. Welcome to Philadelphia Baseball History. On this channel, we talk about the history of baseball from the A's to the Phillies to the 19th century. And sometimes we talk about contemporary baseball issues. So if you love baseball and if you love Philadelphia, stick around and subscribe to our channel. Our heroes. They were given a special place of honor in our cathedrals to glory. You too can honor your heroes of your youth. Just go to PhiladelphiaBaseballHistory.com I remember when the Phillies signed Pete Rose. He was the biggest free agent signing at the time. Remember, in 1978, free agency was still new. It was like, what, two years old? and Pete Rose was the biggest name who had ever been signed as a free agent. And he chose to come to Philadelphia. Now, I was seven years old. I grew up in a household that loved baseball. My parents would take my sister and I and my cousins. We would go to Veterans Stadium every weekend. Because you know, the Saturday and Sunday home games, that's when they had the giveaways for the kids. Batting gloves, t-shirts, jackets, backpacks. So we loved going to the ball game and we loved our Phillies. So even at seven years old, I knew who Pete Rose was and I'd already had an opinion of him. I didn't like him. I thought he was a crybaby. I thought he was the kind of player who would just cry and whine whenever he didn't get his way. And I didn't like that. It's funny though, when somebody like that signs for your team and suddenly, instead of being a crybaby, he becomes being a tough in your face player. Now at the time, the Phillies had built this wonderfully talented team from the ground up. I mean, their farm system pumped out a lot of really good, talented players. Bob Boone, Larry Boa, Greg Lazinski, Mike Schmidt. And from 1976 through 1978, they won the National League East three years in a row. In 1976, the Phillies broke their franchise record for most wins in a season. But then, they ran into that big red machine juggernaut. They were swept by the Reds. Which I don't think the Phillies should have any shame over. I mean, look at that team. Johnny Bench, Joe Morgan, Tony Perez, Pete Rose. That was a talented team. But in 1977 and 1978, the Phillies, they essentially beat themselves in the playoffs. <laughs> why did he put? Why didn't he put Jerry Martin in left field? Why he, all year he kept, took Lazinski out in left field and put Jerry Martin in. I see Manny Moda hit this this pop fly to left field. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> They fell apart, and so the Phillies had a reputation that they would choke 
that they couldn't take that last step to becoming a championship team. And that was what Pete Rose was supposed to do. Pete Rose was signed as that veteran presence, that veteran player in the clubhouse who was supposed to help guide this team of young, talented players and ground them and turn them into a championship team. When Pete came over in 79, his philosophy was just get me to the playoffs, fellas, and I'll, you know, take the take the rest of the way, which was true. So that helped. I mean, all those guys, like Pete said in an interview once, all these guys, when he came to Philadelphia, it was, they all came up around the same time. Boone, Lazinski, Schmidt, Boa. Uh, and they were all, no, they were all great athletes and great players, but nobody knew who to look to for leadership because there was, there wasn't any proven winner on that team because they all came up relatively around the same time. And then when Pete comes in, and just made them all better. When Piero signed with the Phillies, he promised he was going to bring a pennant to Philadelphia. And then came 1979. It was a very disappointing season. Even with Pete Rose, the finish finished what? Fourth? Fifth in the division? They were well out of the playoffs. I mean, 1979 was so bad, it got Danny Ozark fired. But then came the magical year of 1980 and the investment in Pete Rose paid off. Rose rips it into left field, it's in for a base hit. Bowe will score, it's a two to one ball game. Christensen to second base. Billy's got one of them back and still nobody out in the inning. Pete Rose was the kind of player who would do anything to win. Pete Rose always played hard. I don't think Pete Rose knew any other way to play except to play hard. That's why he had the nickname Charlie Hustle. And you know, it didn't matter whether it was the All-Star game and he rolled over Ray Fossey or it was the 1980 NLCS and he bowled over Bruce Bochy. That's how Pete Rose always played. Tough, in-your-face baseball. Always. Pete Rose knew how to get on base. And Pete Rose knew how to score. So yeah, I give Pete Rose a lot of credit for bringing that world championship team to Philadelphia in 1980. And Mike Schmidt gives Pete Rose a lot of credit for helping to develop him into the Hall of Fame player that he is. You could he, see, yeah, he was more of a leader. And he says he learned a lot from Pete Rose. He became a better hitter. And I attribute a lot of that to Pete Rose. Pete Rose in 79 and 80 taught him how to, because Schmidt at that time before Pete got there was susceptible to the away pitch, he'd swing and flail. Because he was a power hitter, he would just pull it. And Pete showed him, look, if it's away, go with it. Go away and hit a line drive off the wall for a double. So that year in 80, I mean, before the 80, Schmidt was like a 245, 255 type hitter. He had 280, 282, I think in 1980, which for a power hitter at that time was phenomenal. He got 48 homers and a 282 average. And then in 81, he had 316. Of course, it was a strike short season, but you could see that he was becoming a complete hitter in his 30s in the 1980s. And for Phillies fans, the four years that Pete Rose was with the team, that was a wild ride. We got a real treat. We got to see Pete Rose break the National League hit record. He passed Stan Musial while he was playing with the Phillies. That was awesome. And while I was sorry to see Pete Rose go, I never stopped rooting for him. Even when Pete Rose was playing for the Expos, even when he was a player manager for the Reds, I was rooting for him. I wanted him to be the hit king. I wanted him to pass Ty Cobb. I remember when the news broke about Pete Rose's gambling. It was devastating. It was very disappointing. You know, at first I didn't want to believe it, but he admitted it. He had gambled on baseball. And Pete Rose served time in jail. He served time for tax evasion, all connected to his gambling. When the commissioner's office got an inkling that Pete Rose might have been gambling on baseball games, they hired an attorney to do an investigation, an experienced attorney, John Dowd. John Dowd had worked for the attorney general, and he became a sort of special counsel for the commissioner's office. He conducted the investigation into the allegations that Pete Rose had been gambling. It was his report and his 
investigation that led to Pete Rose being suspended from baseball. And you know, let's not mince words. Pete Rose agreed to the suspension. Pete Rose admitted that he gambled on baseball. But after Pete Rose served his time in jail, and after a certain number of years had passed since the allegations, a number of us Phillies fans, a number of Pete Rose fans, we thought that enough time had passed and it was time for Pete Rose essentially to be forgiven, to be allowed back into the game, to be allowed into the Hall of Fame. And I think the commissioner's office tried to facilitate that. They tried to make it so that Pete Rose could return to the game. That's why the Phillies felt comfortable allowing Pete Rose to be placed on the Wall of Fame. But it was the end of July of 2017. That's when the news broke. You see, about, what, one or two years before that, John Dowd was on the radio, and while he was on the radio, John Dowd was talking about his investigation of Pete Rose. And Dowd said that he believed Pete Rose had committed statutory rape. Michael Berlini, you know, told us that he not only ran bets, but he ran young girls for him down in spring training, ages 12 to 14, isn't that lovely? So that's statutory rape every time you do that. And when Pete Rose heard this, he was livid. He filed a lawsuit. He said that John Dowd's allegations that he had committed statutory rape was hurting his reputation and was hurting his ability to get endorsements. So he sued John Dowd for defamation. But here's the thing. When Pete Rose gave a deposition, a sworn statement, his defense wasn't, no, I didn't do it. His defense was, she was 16 at the time, and in Ohio, 16 is the age of consent. So, yeah, I, I didn't commit statutory rape. Okay, as a technical, legal matter, he may not have committed statutory rape, but he was in his mid-30s, he was married, he had children, and he was preying upon a teenager. And I have to say it that way, preying. A teenager, 16 years old. I mean, there's a lot I can forgive. I can forgive the gambling. I can overlook the tax evasion. But I'm a father, and I'm a father of a girl. I can't, I can't imagine what goes through somebody's head to think that it's okay to prey upon a teenager. And that's why I think the Phillies did the right thing when they canceled it. And that's why I, I have a problem with Pete Rose being placed in the Hall of Fame. He's got a moral failing. It goes beyond gambling. He's got a very big moral failing. And I don't think the man should be honored over it. I can recognize that he was a fantastic baseball player. I can recognize that he had incredible talent. But you can't ignore the morality. Pete Rose is his own worst enemy. Special thanks to our patron, Ray Easterday. You too can support this channel by going over to the patreon.com. Also check out our merch store at philadelphiabaseballhistory.com. We'll have all relevant links in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching.